morning. Welcome to the Kitty Hawk Investor Series. My name is Will Wiseman. It is a great pleasure to have our Kitty Hawk community joining us today. We've got uh, on our fireside call today some of our LPs, our advisors, uh, great friends of Kitty Hawk Ventures, and the CEOs of many of our portfolio companies. So as you know, we are a frontier technology focused venture capital firm. We've got about 10% of our portfolio in the space sector. And so you can imagine it's a, a great thrill uh, and, and a real treat to have joining us today, uh, a real titan from the space industry, George Whitesides. Uh, if you can humor me for a minute, I'm gonna read George's, uh, some of his, uh, his background here because it really is extraordinary. Uh, so George is the chairman of the Space Advisory Board for Virgin Galactic. He was the first CEO of the company growing Virgin Galactic over 10 years from a small team to the global aerospace firm that it is today. Under George's leadership, the company flew the first human spacecraft from the U.S. soil since the retirement of the space shuttle, flew the first woman to space on a commercial vehicle, and took the company public via a SPAC on the New York Stock Exchange. George also oversaw the formation and growth of Virgin Orbit, a satellite launch company based in Long Beach, from its founding as a small team inside Virgin Galactic in 2011 to a 400-person operation that was spun out in 2017. Between Galactic and Orbit, Whitesides has raised over $3 billion of capital in private and public transactions, created roughly $10 billion in public market capitalization, Prior to Galactic, George worked on President Obama's transition team in 2008 and subsequently served as NASA Chief of Staff for NASA Administrator Charlie Bolden. George was awarded the Distinguished Service Medal, NASA's highest honor, upon his departure in 2010. George also serves on a variety of philanthropic councils and boards and now focuses much of his energy on using technology to help solve societal problems. So George, it is an amazing CV, and it is really such a great pleasure to have you joining us today. And uh, I wanted to start off by just saying a big congratulations. Uh, I have to imagine after you know many many years of uh, of hard effort on your part and the team's part to to see the successful launch happen in July must have been uh, really really extraordinary. So congratulations. Thanks, Will. Yeah, it's always it's always fun and kind of amazing when this thing that you're working towards in the future becomes this thing that happened in the past. And I know probably a lot of people on this call have had that experience, too. So it was great. Awesome. So you were part of some key kind of structural and foundational changes that happened uh, at NASA that basically set the stage for the private space industry as we are seeing it emerge today. And I thought maybe we could kind of begin this by talking a little bit about some of the things that that uh, were put in place there and, and kind of how it's uh, coming to fruition today. Yeah, I mean, um, you know, for a long time, I mean, I think just at the start, NASA is like one of the gems in our federal uh, government, right? It is filled with amazing people doing incredible things, exploring the universe. And I think it's also true that um, there was a dynamic that did not necessarily encourage innovation in human spaceflight for many years, you know, because NASA pursued a kind of a centrally planned model and there was kind of a given system, you know, and, and that was what the entire aerospace sector supported was that system, in this case, you know, the space shuttle. And so there wasn't sort of that dynamic of competition and innovation. And, and you know, when, when we got there in 2008, um, we wanted to support uh, trends that were already going on, um, you know, to to push more innovation and push more competition into the system. And, uh, you know, that was crystallized probably around the decision to pursue a, an idea for commercially provided crew transport to the International Space Station. But there was a whole bunch of other stuff, you know, going on and satellites, small satellites, other things. And um, I think a bunch of good decisions were made. And, you know, 10 years later, American space industry and, and the world's space industry are just doing amazing things, right? There's so much innovation in the sector. There's now this long tail of different companies and different stages of, of, of financing. And it's just so encouraging. I mean, it's what we all dreamed about 10 or 20 years ago was to have that, um, that, uh, that innovative landscape. And, you know, I think some of the decisions that we all made 10 years or so ago helped support that. Yeah, it's it's pretty extraordinary to see uh, you know how far we we've come and and um, 
Virgin Galactic started with the birth of, you know, from basically an X Prize. We had Peter on here a while ago, and the Ansari X Prize was kind of the the birth of that technology. And I think the challenge was to send a spacecraft with three people uh, up 100 kilometers, uh, bring it back down, and then launch it again, uh, the same ship within a two week period. And then that was Bert Rutan and his group. And I think that technology was acquired by uh, Virgin Galactic and ultimately turned into uh, into uh, what we see today. Maybe you can talk to us a little bit about, you know, where was Virgin Galactic when you joined? What year was this? And and take us a little bit through through some of the journey. Well, I think even before that, I should say, like, I was, I think, one of the few people who attended, like, all of the um, powered flights for the Spaceship One program, which was, of course, this little vehicle, you know, that Scale had built to, to win the X Prize. And uh, I remember one cold December, I think it was in December of 2003, going up there. I, th I think it was one of the anniversaries of a, of a Wright Brother launch, and they did mm -hmm. a short burn. And I was up there with Jim Benson, freezing my butt off, you know, in the Mojave flight line, watching this small vehicle make make history. And nobody was there, you know. But of course, uh, in the next year, everybody was there, and it was such a big moment for hmm. the space industry. And uh, so, a few months later, I went and I bought a couple tickets on board Virgin Galactic. So I was a customer first in 2005, and I kind of stayed that way for a bit. And I went off, and I did NASA and various other things. And then by 2010, um, I think they they uh, the, the company was was I think a, largely a marketing organization at that point. They had started to hire a, a couple of uh, technical people, um, but the path ahead was to literally create an aerospace manufacturing company and an aerospace operations company, and to do it in the field of human spaceflight. And you know, probably a lot of people on the on the line today know that each of those things. Is Pretty yeah. hard thing to do. Yeah. So that's what we did. You know, we set out to hire good people, and good people had done it elsewhere. But mixing, you know, air, uh, airplane and space cultures, which are two totally different things in many respects, because it's a rocket plane, and and uh, yeah, so we grew it from you know maybe a couple dozen people up to, um, you know, when I stepped back, it was you know over eight nine hundred uh, people. Can you talk a little bit about uh, culture? I mean, it's you know it's such an audacious goal to to build a spaceship and um and uh, a business to support uh space tourism and space flight and um you know how do you think about you mentioned space culture and, and aviation culture like what are the two differences there how do you think about creating a, a company that is you know, uh, can continue to be focused and driven when it's such a, you know, long, long journey, right, to get to your actual success. So, so uh, Virgin Galactic, what was the year it was uh, founded? It was really kind of formally founded in, I guess, 2004, 2005. Um, okay. So like 15, 16 years journey to basically get to this successful launch. I mean, that yeah. is a long time to keep people motivated and excited and engaged and a lot of you know fires to fight and challenges to overcome. So how did you think about leading and, and creating a, an organization to, to take that on? Well, you know, there's the old um, saw that, you know, uh, I think everyone who's, who's running an organization wishes they spent more time uh, emphasizing culture. What was cool was that we kind of had a chance to do it again with Virgin Orbit. So, um, you know, we, we kind of had essentially two companies um, eventually. And um, I like to think about culture, you know, in, in, in the stages of a, of a company is kind of like you have this big bang inflationary moment. And if you don't kind of get it right before that big bang inflationary moment, you know, you're going to bake in maybe a culture that you don't want uh, later on. It becomes just much harder to shift the culture when you're up, you know, with many hundreds of people. Um, and so we did spend a lot of time thinking about culture for us, like, you know, we wanted to create a, a culture of safety and, um, uh, you know, clear internal communication, but also we were trying to marry in uh, the virgin culture of, of having fun and, and um, having a little bit of um, maybe uh, not counterculture, but kind of a, a little bit doing things differently, right? And yeah. And how you do that in the context of aerospace manufacturing. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> With, well, you've got a founder, right, who is yeah. known for bringing just that kind of flavor to uh, to his endeavor. So, yeah, that must have been interesting. Yeah, which which was interesting. You know, when you look at the companies like Virgin Atlantic, they've actually got a really strong operational culture, but it's very different from the front-facing consumer culture um, that, you know, you kind of see in the marketing. And so 
mixing that all together was was a bit of a challenge but i think we i think we did it right so that people felt like i think the main thing was that ultimately people felt like the, the management of the company was fully bought into the mission you know like 100 percent. this was we were there and we were going to fly richard branch space and get this thing commercially started um and there was an understanding that everybody was you know this was something that was going to make um a difference in the world and and that was going to be you know the, one of the big things in everybody's life and mm. from the you know the folks who are cleaning the shop floor to ceo and everybody else inside i think that was the kind of people and the kind of culture that i tried to build and i think it served the company well as it went through the inevitable ups and downs along the way yeah i mean one of those um which if you don't mind i'd love to just kind of uh, talk about briefly was the the 2014 um, uh, uh, failure and tragic loss of life of the of the co-pilot um, during one of the flights. I mean, how do you, as a leader, you know, handle such a uh, intense and and traumatic um, uh, experience and, and time? I mean, not only you know loss of life. Uh, I, I assume there must have been kind of some existential. Uh, questions about the company and its viability. And again, because it's such a long, long journey, how did you bring people together and, you know, do what you need to do as a leader in terms of consoling you know, the team and, and ultimately get people back on, on track? Yeah, I mean, that was a really tough time. Um, uh, the first thing is turn off CNN and take care of the people, right? Um, mm -hmm. And we did that, but I think you know what we had in our corner were a couple things. Number one was um, Richard uh, Branson deciding relatively early, like we're not going to give up. We're going to keep doing this because this matters, and and the right thing to do uh, is to is to make sure we we get this done. But the other thing was that um, commitment, and also I think actually the aerospace community, and you know this just because I don't know other communities as well, you know, is is intrinsically a fairly resilient. Um, uh, personality type, I guess, you know, these are people, you know, our, our, our team included people who had gone through space shuttle crashes, test flight crashes, a, a lot of different things. And, you know, for better, or for worse, when you're working in, um, this kind of field, this is not, um, something that never happens. It, it's something that unfortunately happens. And that's why we revere, um, test pilots so much because what they're doing is they're doing work that makes it safer for the rest of us to, to do something, whether whether that's an air aviation type uh, vehicle or something else. And so we were able to rely on people who had gone through this kind of experience, who shared that their journey with younger engineers who had never been through that, you know, and who are, mm -hmm. uh, you know, kind of freaked out. Um, but I think at the end of the day, it was our shared commitment to this matters for the future of humanity and you know we can't give up we got to keep doing it and and as long as people feel that that is something that is shared all the way up um then they're gonna just jump right back into it and get to the the they they'll mourn of course along the way and you have to give people space to that for that but you also have to give them tasks immediately to you know get back on the horse and and keep moving forward um one thing that just kind of um uh, occurred to me is maybe it, it might be helpful to kind of talk about the bigger mission for Virgin Galactic, because um, it's not just space tourism, uh, is my understanding. Yeah, I mean, so um, I'm somebody who believes strongly in the importance of space, right? And um, uh, space is important to us for all kinds of reasons, right? I mean, there's there's GPS, communications, spinoffs, all these different things. But I fundamentally believe that um, the perspective of space is super important to our future, right? Like, you know, there's uh, uh, Stuart Brand talking about, you know, picture of Earth would do a lot to, to move forward um, our shared conception of this planet. And then, the, you know, seminal pictures of our blue marble, uh, you know, in the 19, early 1970s through Apollo and how that transformed the environmental movement in, in a lot of ways and globalized it. Um, and I have always personally thought that sending people into space will have a transformative impact on how we perceive the planet and how we perceive the biggest challenges that we've got now over the next hundred years. And so I shared that perspective with our with our team and with Richard. And, um, you know, uh, I think people really, really got that. And that, that you know, that having sharing that perspective, enabling more and more people, not just the super uh, supermen and women of the NASA professional astronaut corps, but all different kinds of people 
um, was going to be important to uh, solving our world's global challenges on a, on a local level because the people that we were going to take up were going to um, you know, bring that perspective back with them and they were going to become minor celebrities in their own place and then and they could share that perspective. Mm -hmm. And so I really fundamentally believe that that is true. And I think we're seeing that already with, um, you know, amazing people who've gone up like on the last flight and, and who are now able to have that as a platform. Yeah, what did you hear from them? Like, how did it, how did it change their, you know, shift their thinking? It, it really did shift their thinking and, and, um, you know, and, 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 you know, it doesn't happen for everybody, but it happens for most, I would say. And that's, you know, something called the overview effect. And it's a, it's an amazing thing. And we're obviously only giving people, you know, a taste of that, right? It'd be great to give everybody an orbital space flight, but it costs, you know, 40 million bucks or 50 million bucks. And so that's not for everybody. This experience will be something that many more people can do, you know, 10x, 100x, 1000x, 10,000x, which will be uh, fantastic. Now, long term, you know, I, th I think personally think uh, that the company also has, you know, great potential for all kinds of different things, whether it's, you know, point-to-point uh, -point travel or, you know, high-speed point-to-point travel or even greater things in, in Earth orbit or, or beyond. So I think that, you know, establishing a foothold in something that is really a fundamentally new, new market. It's not a government um, based market, which in the world of aerospace is really rare. Most, <laughs> you know, many of the things in space ultimately trace their way back to government. Uh, the only major exception to that is like direct TV, which is, you know, like has been a good product over the last couple decades. But you know, um, it, it's a new product and it's a new service and, and uh, you know, it's just getting started, but I think it's going to have a transformative impact on how we see the planet. Yeah, it is really incredible to see this whole ecosystem kind of being birthed and, and just the, the innovation that's taking place and the, the sheer amount of, you know, capital investment that's, uh, that's taking place is just extraordinary. Um, so I, I've heard from uh, other folks in, in the space industry that it's like designing the spaceship in many ways is actually the, the easy part. And it's really the manufacturing and the new inventions and you know, innovation that, that needs to take place in order to actually create the new materials and new processes in order to be able to build the, the ships is you know, where the real challenge is. Would you is that? Do you agree with that? And, uh, you know, I'd love to understand that a little bit more. That was kind of, I hadn't really thought about that um, uh, prior and found that to be, you know, really, really interesting. Just kind of thinking about, you know, where the, the friction points are and, and uh, what makes this business such a challenging business. Yeah, I mean, build, building har hardware is, you know, from scratch is always hard and building hardware that people go in is really hard because you really need to make sure that um, you have a, uh, well thought through quality and safety culture and all the processes that go along with that. Um, as I kind of mentioned earlier, you know, uh, Virgin Galactic is interesting in that it tries to marry essentially an airplane culture with a space culture. And those are two different engineering um, sort of phenotypes. And, and they obviously share a lot of linkages, but they're, you know, they're different in, in many ways. And so we had to bring together those two different sides of things. You know, it, it, uh, airplanes are, are very, uh, sort of regimented um, and have, uh, you know, 100 years of certification processes and things behind them. And then you have the space world, which also has incredibly good engineering, but, you know, is is more in the realm of, um, I guess, uh, you know, it's, it's a different kind of thing um, in, in a general sense. And so um, bringing those two things together was really interesting. And, and really, that's why it takes a while is because you're, you're not just sort of like, you can't just like hire somebody to put something together. You have to have somebody that checks that that thing is put together and then uh, well and and, uh, and and making all those things work together in a system is something that just takes a, a fair amount of time. And um, it, it, at the end of the day, I'm really proud of where we ended up. I think we have an amazing organization of people who are doing all those different steps. Um, there's a great movement or an interesting movement towards, you know, essentially uh, vertical insourcing um, that was really pioneered a lot by by Elon and others, um, but we're we're living in a world where you know an organization with enough capital can really you know almost do it all themselves if they're willing to make the capital investments to do that, and and we felt that that was necessary to sort of maintain our our quality um, pathway. Gotcha. Um, you touched on uh, on capital. I think during your um, uh, your intro mentioned that you had uh, been involved with raising. A 
approximately $3 billion worth of capital in, in private and public markets. Uh, we've got a bunch of entrepreneurs uh, joining us on this call who have some pretty uh, big dreams of them, uh, you know, on their own and that will be very capital intensive. And, um, and so I, I'm curious as to, you know, how do you, how did you think about kind of the capital raises and the capital requirements for this business? And did you have any trepidation about jumping into something that you knew was going to be so capital intensive? And, you know, is it a, a build it, develop it and, and the capital will come or, you know, I don't know, love to kind of understand your thinking and, and kind of the, the major inflection points as you were building Virgin Galactic. Well, you know, I mean, it was funny when I first uh, arrived at Galactic in 2010, we were just closing a deal with Abu Dhabi um, to um, uh, it, it had it had been delayed and and had to go through a CFIUS uh, process, which we successfully closed and everything was was, um, y you know, moving forward. Um, I, th I think Richard, you know, coming to an agreement with um, an investor in Abu Dhabi in the heart of the financial crisis for a space uh, tourism company has probably got to be one of the greatest, you know, fundraising stories of, of all time. Um, but anyway, you know, um, I think we obviously had the luxury of having a, uh, an amazingly committed founder in our, um, you know, back seat to, um, make sure that things, uh, kept going. But what I, what I think is, um, you know, at, at the end of the day, important is really kind of simple stuff is, is having a big vision, having markets that support that vision, um, and, uh, and having, uh, you know, a smart strategy that, um, is incremental along the way to get to that. Right. And, and, um, you know, I think that we're living in an amazing time, right. Will, where, um, these big dreams can be financed, you know, and, and, and maybe, you know, there are maybe some limits to that, right. Like it's, it, you know, raising $20 billion without selling anything is kind of challenging, right. but, um, you know, raising a billion is totally possible. And, and, um, and, and what a world that we live in. It means that we can finance these big dreams, whether it's through, you know, all these SPACs or whether it's through private equity or, you know, even just big rounds, you know, B, B rounds, you know, C rounds, whatever, you know, there's, there's, uh, there's tremendous capital out there. And so I think it's just an amazing time to be a builder because um, I don't think there's ever been a time with this much capital for these kind of long term projects. Yeah, it's it's uh, it really is extraordinary. It's an extraordinary time to be an entrepreneur and to be uh, an investor. And you know the the, uh, the the impact that you can have, the speed at which you can scale, and the boldness of the ideas that are getting embraced and funded is just extraordinary. And turned into real you know real businesses. Some of these things, it's just can't couldn't have imagined them getting funded, you know, five years ago. And, uh, and so really, really exciting to see and exciting to be, uh, to be part of, you know, we, I know you are now starting to, to shift into kind of a, a next chapter here and space will always be an important part of your, uh, your life and, and your involvement. And, but you're also starting to think about some of the other, uh, big problems that, uh, that are facing society that you can go out and, and address. So I'd love to kind of, you know, what do you, uh, focusing your energies on what are you excited about and how are you thinking about tackling some of these uh, some of these different problems? Well, you know, this year um, I, I sort of set myself the task of of working on a couple of different philanthropic areas or things that could have um, potential future business areas. And 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 honestly, the main one has been wildfires. And I think that this is something you know, if, if anybody lives on the West Coast, you know about. I mean, it's it's a huge problem. It's just going to get worse every year for probably decades to come. And um, I think that we could do better as a country uh, in terms of how we manage uh, these things, but also how much innovation we bring um, to, uh, to this problem. And, and it's, it's one of these classic wicked problems where you, know, you can't point to one thing and say, okay, if I fix that one thing, then everything's gonna be okay. You know, there's 20 different things that, that need work on. But what I've been trying to do with a collection of other you know, CEOs and other innovators is, is to bring sort of a, you know, a, maybe a private sector approach, particularly, but, but also complemented by the amazing power of the federal government. Um, you know, uh, when, when it gets moving, you know, and in some of these drafts for the reconciliation bill, you know, you can see billions of dollars move in this direction. Um, the big things can happen there too. And so, so um, I, I'm really focused on this. Uh, wildfires are, are obviously important because, you know, people's house and lives are, are at stake. But it's also a huge carbon emitter, uh, you know, 15 to 20 percent, up to up to 15 to 20 percent of the world's 
annual carbon emissions come from these uh, big fires. And so um, this is a huge, huge problem. And it's something that um, we're just not um, uh, fully properly organized for. One of the things that I like to say is that actually, in, in many cases, we have a better um, understanding and sense of a uh, foreign battle space, right? Like over Afghanistan or somewhere else mm. uh, than we do when it comes to a wildfire over like Santa Rosa, you know? And, uh, you know, we're working to improve that, but we're not there yet. And that is kind of crazy when you think about it, because every year now, probably for the rest of the li our, our lives, there's going to be billions of dollars of damage and probably dozens of people killed every year uh, from wildfires and, and actually many orders of magnitude more from smoke inhalation. We know that's going to happen with 100% certainty. And yet a lot of our sort of national security conception is focused on foreign threats, which, you know, I don't want to denigrate. Those are very important and we need to spend resources on them. But we really need to make sure that we're taking care of our homeland in, in this broader sense of security. And I think right now we, we have a mismatch between uh, the resources and organizations that we're, that we're uh, dedicating toward, towards some of those threats. Yeah, yeah, I, I so agree with that. Just the, the lack of uh, resiliency in our infrastructure here. You think about the energy grid or we, we have not mobilized to really take on and you know, tackle and solve these, these very significant problems. And uh, so many of them, especially on the fire side, I mean, you have lightning strikes, that's one thing, but uh, in California, we've had a lot of these fires sparked from transformers and power lines and things that, you know, those things could reside underground. There's a lot of things that we could be doing to kind of create uh, a much safer environment. And uh, there is a, a fire detection X prize that's taking place that Peter is working on. We have a portfolio company, Sky, that is building a high altitude platform for earth observation that will have a lot of applicability for fire detection uh, and, um, and and lots of kind of earth observation sensors. So it feels like, you know, we're starting to address this, but given the, the risk, the challenges, the health issues, um, uh, the loss of life and, and structure, uh, structures, uh, you know, something that I'm kind of surprised that we haven't seen kind of an amplification of those efforts. And, you know, I don't know if it's a, a czar or, but it's some, it needs to be a very senior uh, leader in the government kind of leading these, uh, these efforts. And I got to imagine that is going to create all sorts of incredible uh, innovation on the entrepreneurial side as well. Yeah, I mean, you're absolutely right. Like we need to do more on the government side and organize better. But I think innovators can bring a lot of, uh, and I'm so excited by the community of folks who are popping up. I think there are a lot of people who are like, this is a huge problem. We're not doing enough about it. How can right. I like help, right? So right. if anybody wants to, you know, maybe they can get in touch with you, Will, and and um, feel free to reach out to me and I can connect them into this this growing group of people who are sort of like private citizens thinking, hey, we got to we gotta do, uh, we got to do more. We will get our hands um better around the problem, but be, we're, we're kind of really behind the eight ball and we're going to be digging ourselves out of a hole for a, for a while, both both due to forest management and due to, uh, you know, the underlying problems of climate change. Right, right. Yeah, it, it, you know, this speaks to the opportunity now of doing well by doing good. And you can really create these amazing businesses, access a ton of capital and go out and solve very uh, pressing kind of public, you know, societal uh, problems, which is uh, a really exciting place to be. And you can do that without being an impact uh, only focused, uh, you know, fun. Yeah, I'll, I'll give you a great example of that. Um, you know, like right now, I'm talking with a very large company about doing a, a, a Leo small sat constellation around wildfire detection, right. Mm -hmm. And, um, and, and, and yet the US government has like certain assets, classified assets that could also do something along those lines, maybe not as well, but something and so it's a really interesting question, like, how can you get that capability to people and frontline firefighters faster? You know, is it just go raise a, a couple hundred million dollars and, you know, do it using private sources? Or is it to, like, try to convince the right people inside the federal government that this is actually a real problem that they should be convinced? Of? And, and I'm not sure what the right answer is there. My guess is that the private sector is the, is the fastest way to bring that capability, which is kind of unfortunate in a way, because you kind of think, like, this should be a public good, right? Like, yeah. if my backyard is about to go up on flames. Like, that's a public good, right? But um, but I do think that there are great opportunities, uh, and as you say, do well with by doing doing real, something that's really important for our country. Yeah, yeah. Energy is also another uh, interesting area, and I think that's uh, also an area that you are uh, starting to spend some some cycles on uh, as well. Can you maybe talk a little bit about what what interests you there and what you find yourself kind of being drawn towards? 
Yeah, I mean, I, th I think the analogy for me is, is um, you know, obviously we, we all know the direction that we need to head. And the question is, what's the strategy that we use to, to move this global system towards a, a better place? And, you know, I, I, I think there are probably a, people, a, lot, a lot of people on this call who know a lot more about this space than I do. So I really hesitate to say much. But I will say that, you know, the, the, the principles, I think, that we can draw from experience of, of, of long-term hardware intensive um, uh, uh, programs is something that we're going to need for the energy space. No question, whether it's, you know, nuclear, fission, fusion, or, um, uh, you know, green hydrogen, whatever, grid transformation, all these things are going to take a long time to uh, develop and bring to market and then and then achieve at scale. And so, you know, I, I think in some ways, the, the story of space is like a, a, a heartening example, right? Something where people knew what needed to happen 20 years ago, and then they were starting to convince people that the right directions, you know, and, and, and inspire innovators, you know, over the next 10 years. And then those innovators working with uh, the public, uh, with, with the government, uh, you know, were able to achieve great, remarkable change, you know. And there's that uh, great saying, right, that humans um, uh, uh, overestimate what can be done in the short term and underestimate what can be done in the long term. And God, we need that, right, uh, when it comes to, you know, space. So, so I think, uh, sorry, energy. So I think, you know, like, Hopefully, space is like a, a positive example of what uh, humans can do um, when the right sort of ecosystem and, and and sort of guiding principles are established at a national or international scale uh, scale to achieve the 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 type of change that um, is the right direction for our planet. Yeah, that's right. I think it's all about uh, alignment and the scope of the. The opportunity there is just extraordinary. I, mean, I think it's going to be the single biggest economic opportunity to try to solve climate change. And so many things obviously uh, feed into that. So uh, really important and, and really exciting uh, place to be uh, to be focused. I, I will say that, you know, one of the great insights, I've been talking to a lot of smart people recently. And I think one of the things that, you know, governments and others maybe can help with is is that, you know, the customer part of, of energy is is a really challenging one, right? Like sort of sometimes conservative customers and, um, uh, you know, that, that don't want to maybe take on new things. And so how we bring along the system, that's why we need like systems engineering type thinking for this global problem. And, and it's the same thing in wildfires too. It's like, you need to really take a step back and look at this problem you know, with all your hats on, with engineering hat on, science hat on, policy hat on, cultural hat on, you know, and figure out how all these things fit together and then where can you attack? And, um, you know, th that's, I think, you know, going to be a really important, that's what we need. You know, we need these like holistic leaders, CEOs and founders who can sort of look broadly and who are technically educated and understand, you know, the technical thing, um, but who also sort of understand product market fit and how they can move things uh, into a system and, you know, um, that dynamic is fascinating. And I think, you know, finding people who can do that are going to be and, and, and giving them the capital to do stuff is going to be really part of the keys to actually making a difference in these problems.